Dr. John Fow. Uh, he is an associate professor of biology at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. He received a BS in biology and chemistry from St. Lawrence University and his PhD in zoology from Duke University. He joined UCF in 2003 after previous stints with the College of Charleston and Denison University. His research interests include the ecology, conservation, and restoration of freshwater wetlands and coral reefs, and fire ecology. Dr. Fouth has conducted uh, more than 500 research dives and is certified as a wildland firefighter. And today he's going to be talking to us today about um, evapotranspiration and hydrology of uh, Carolina Willow. Now, I want to point out that the work I'll be talking about today is done in collaboration, again, with Pedro Quintana Asensio and also Ross Hinkle at UCF and Ding Bao Wang, who's in UCF's Department of um, Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering. So you'll see one equation in this talk, and Ding Bao is responsible for that. Um, the other thing I'd like to say before I start out is that I've worked in national parks, national forests, state parks, state forests, uh, all sorts of different lands around the country. And there's a few groups that have really stood out in my mind as really great collaborators. Um, and one of them is the Water Management District. And I'm not saying that just because they're here and they funded this project, but they really do practice um, adaptive management. They're great collaborators. They work hard. They're smart. They give us a lot of feedback. And just to give you an example, the paper that we wrote about the island experiment, that went through 24 revisions where they commented on it, and especially Kim Ponzio, I said I was going to give a shout out to Kim, um, was really intent on making that paper the best it could possibly be. And that sort of intensity is really, really great. Um, a couple of the other groups that are like that are the Florida DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program. And I'd also say the um, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is like that. So we've got some groups in Florida who are really doing uh, great work and, and they're governmental agencies. So, this adaptive management cycle is something that you see in a lot of textbooks. Everybody talks about doing it, but not many people actually do it, or not many groups. Um, but we'll see, in, as I present my talk, that we've gone through this step. And folks in this room were really instrumental, it's my understanding, the waterfowlers and also the, the fishing groups, in letting the district know that willow was encroaching onto their favorite habitats, making it impossible to get boats in there so you couldn't hunt, you couldn't fish. You couldn't move through the marsh anymore because you had this willow swamp. Um, and so, let's see if I can get the pointer right here. So assessing that problem and making the um, observations is really the first step. And then we go through um, the additional steps of designing a project to investigate what's going on, implementing it, monitoring it, evaluating it, and then um, getting an adjustment. Uh, adjusting the management. So to start off with, because you may not be familiar with it, and I've learned a lot about evapotranspiration in the last couple years, what is it? Well, in the hydrologic or the water cycle, it's the way, ah, these things are really close together. Um, it's the way that water comes off of surfaces, different sources, and gets up into the atmosphere. So there's evaporation from surfaces, such as lakes, the river itself, out of the soil. But then there's also transpiration, which is coming from the plants themselves. And that's sending the water up into the atmosphere, and then it gets transported. And in Florida, we don't have to worry about snowmelt runoff, uh, but we get quite a bit of precipitation that more than makes up for it. So why do plants transpire? Well, the reason that plants transpire is that in the leaves and, and the photosynthetic tissues in the cells, they need water in order to um, undergo photosynthesis. That's how they make their food. So carbon dioxide plus water gives you the carbohydrates and the oxygen. So water comes in and enters the root hairs by osmosis, but what brings it up the stem is a loss of water from the leaves. So there's a, basically just a continuous train of water moving up from the roots out through the leaves. That's driving photosynthesis, it's driving the transport, but the other important thing it does, especially here in Florida, is it cools down the plants, 
All right, those plants are out there just baking in the sun. They would really overheat if they weren't able to sweat. So transpiration is just plant sweat. They're using a lot of water. Now, one of the interesting things is that if you look at the global pattern of evapotranspiration, what you see is that where there's the most transpiration, the evapotranspiration, the dark blues and the blacks, tends to be in tropical areas, and it tends to be in areas with high water availability, jungles, things like that. In North America, where we've got that sort of condition is in Florida and along the very extreme coastal areas of the Gulf over towards Texas, Houston way. So the areas that you think of as being really hot and humid and sticky in the summertime, that's where you have the highest evapotranspiration. So why should we care about it? This is part of the assessment part. Well, Carolina willow has the highest evapotranspiration rate of any plant ever measured anywhere. And plant physiologists measure a lot of plants, especially crop plants, because they need to know how much water will those plants require. Um, the willow roots um, run really deep. Um, so they can pull water from soils, and if you know about weeping willows and ornamental willows, they're often planted near um, ponds and lakes and things like that where they'll have access to water. Or if you've got a septic tank, so they'll shoot their roots over to either the septic tank itself or the leach field. So in this upper St. John's River Basin, where you've got, got an herbaceous marsh replaced by Carolina willow, those willows could be robbing the basin of valuable water. And I don't know if you've seen the recent um, study that was done by the University of North Florida where they attempted to put an economic value on the St. John's River. But the economic value, it's hard to sum up all the parts, but the value of that river to the state is in the range of a trillion dollars a year. Not million with an M, not billion with a B, trillions with a T. And so it's a really valuable resource. And just to give you an ex example, we did a quick and dirty study over Easter weekend uh, two years ago where we had some surplus willows, and these are from big cuttings. You know, they're in pots. The pots are in a bucket. We filled the buckets right to the top of the pot and then either left the plant intact, we clipped it, or we just put the equivalent amount of water with no willow potted in there and then just looked at how much water dropped out in the greenhouse over three days. And the willows drew that water down four times faster than the evaporation rate in either of those two treatments. So the willows had the potential to steal a lot of water. So it's one of the things we're talking about is what's called green collar crime. I mean, if this were someone who was going out and slurping up water, you'd arrest them. But it's plants, and you don't even notice it. And you don't even think about what they're doing. So the questions we had led us to design um, a, an experiment that I'll show you in a second. And so what we wanted to know is what's the rate of the Carolina willows evapotranspiration measured in the field out in the actual marsh that we're concerned about, not in the greenhouse, not on reclaimed phosphate mines. Um, we wanted to know if we could control Carolina willow with herbicides because we can't control it with um, other methods very effectively. It's really difficult. And then we wanted to know what's the evapotranspiration rate of the plants that replace the willow. Because if we have something come in that's just as bad as willow, we've made no progress. So our design was really straightforward along the river in four locations. We had a plot where we did nothing to the willows at all, and then two other plots of the same size that received one of two different herbicides that the district wanted to try. Um, each one of those plots is uh, five acres. There's a 50 meter buffer in between it. And then uh, we put down water monitoring wells around the periphery. We've got in the center of the plot weather stations that I'll show you in a second. And in between groups of these three treatments that we call replicates, we've got um, a tower that goes above the willow canopy and has weather instruments up on top of it. So here's the aerial view of one of the experiments. This is at Moccasin Island. So there's a control over here, and you see that you know, there's nothing different between our control plot and all the willows surrounding it. There's one herbicide treatment, another herbicide treatment. So that's a set of three. Right about there is our tower. Here's another herbicide, 
a control, and another herbicide. And these plots are sprayed with helicopters using GPS, and that's why they're such beautiful, pretty little squares. The helicopter pilots are really good at what they do. Oh, so now what I want to do is I want to take you right here, and I'm going to shoot a picture across to there. And so hopefully you can see this. There's the edge of the spray line. All this willow in here, the leaves are dead and they're turning red brown. There's outside of our plot, and those willows are nice and green still. So here's Ding Bao's equation. This is how we actually estimate ET. Um, we're not going to have a test on it, so we can relax. Um, but what you can see is there's a lot of parameters you have to estimate. You have to know things like the latent, to get the latent heat of vaporization, you have to know about net radiation, uh, heat flux out of the ground, the density of the air, all sorts of different things. To get those values, you need some equipment. And so we have some uh, standard meteorological equipment that takes air temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation, wind speed. Um, we need some information about the land surface, the leaf area index, how much leaf surface is out there. We get that by looking at solar radiation above and below the canopy. Um, we need to know the heights of different things. And then in the uh, dry season, we need to know about soil moisture and how deep the water is. Uh, we haven't had to do this for one of our sites at all. It's stayed, the soil's been inundated since we started this study. The other one we had about three weeks where we had to worry about this. So as those of you who are out there every day in the marsh know, uh, this willow swamp is a challenge, okay? It is one of the worst habitats I've ever been in in my life. Um, the only thing I can think of that's worse is mangrove swamp, which is the same structure, except it's got salt marsh mosquitoes and salty water in it instead of fresh. Um, so it's really dense, our plots are big, and we're doing this right. We're going in the middle of the plot. We're not working on the edges. So we got to get in the middle. We've um, cut in about three miles of um, trails to get to our sites. Uh, darn near killed me last summer. So you guys have good eyes. You know, you can identify ducks on the wing, right? Can you find the five biologists in the swamp? There's five in here, and they're no more than seven and a half meters away from the picture point. We can come back and look at it at the break. <laughs> that, that tells you how thick that is in there. So we went in and installed equipment. This is our, uh, our tower. It's a radio antenna mast. Uh, we hauled in 150 pounds of cement and backpacks through the mud to anchor that thing. Um, it's guide actually onto the willows itself. This is our big one. It's seven and a half meters up above the canopy. And we use Swedish climbing ladders, really narrow ladders that are used to climb trees. Uh, to go up that thing and download our data. Um, these are our weather stations that are inside the middle of each plot. Um, you can see that uh, Yin is standing on a, a little step ladder to access it. So these are up about um, six feet, a little over six feet. Um, you can see Luz Castro Morales right here in the white shirt. We'll see her in the next slide, but notice where she is and her head relative to that uh, rain bucket, because that'll be important in a second. Um, and here's my student, Danny Gooding, augering in uh, one of our wells. And you can see it's dry at this point. Okay, so pay attention to lose. Okay, this is about four months later. Um, the water peaked six inches below the bottom of that rain bucket. And if you're in the front, you may be able to see the feet of the rain bucket there are actually below the gunnels of the canoe. So we had to lean and get the canoes, gunnels under, and then lean back and pop it up on the other side so as not to tip over that, you know, not to knock into that rain bucket. So it's a pretty extreme environment. This is not easy work. Um, and here's the rain, uh, the stream heights over time. It, it went down as low as about 12 and a half feet. It peaked here at 16 and a half. If it had gone to 17, we would have had to go out there and put another pole up to get our um, equipment up out of the swamp water. So we, we basically pull this canoe, a little 12 foot square back canoe, down our trails. We don't even paddle, we don't have enough space, we just grab the willows and, and hoist ourselves through. So this is the monitoring stage of that adaptive management cycle. 
So now what I want to do is, is just show you the graphs of what the data look like. And we'll just go through it step by step. So how many plots can you see in here? How many different colors? How many does it look like? It's kind of thin, yeah, hard to see in the back. You know, you might see two, but there's actually three. So this is just for one of our sites, three plots, and they all just sort of look random. It doesn't look like there's much different among, among the plots. So this is our pretreatment data before the herbicides are sprayed. All right, now we spray the herbicides. It takes about two months for them to take an effect on the plants. And so you can see that there's a general downward slope. We're headed into November, so there's less um, sunlight, less radiation, less energy available. The ET is going to drop. But you can see that now we're starting to see some separation between treatments. Okay, now we go into the dormant season, and any separation that there was starts to be diminished as the willows lose their leaves. They're not transpiring anymore. So now all you're seeing is that evaporation off the water surface, and it's pretty consistent and relatively low. So then the next slide I'll show you is what happens in the growing season. The willow get their leaves, and now you see the evapotranspiration rate goes way up, and you start to see differences between the treatments. And so the control is the highest. That's where the willow's intact. This is um, the herbicide AquaSweep, and this is ClearCast, and especially the clear cast initially did a really good job of, of knocking the leaves off the willow. And so this difference here, that's how much water willow is taking out of the system. That's the theft of an ecosystem service, that water that could be going into the marsh, into the river, and downstream. Now you may be asking, well, you know, what's happening right in here? You've got this herbicide, and it doesn't seem to be doing as well as the other. Oh, well. Before I get to that, I just wanted to convince you. I just showed you one panel of data, but at all four of our sites, the pattern's exactly the same. I just want to make sure that you don't think I'm cherry picking data or anything. It's the same. Uh, the control is here. Here, the two herbicides are doing similarly. Control here, um, one in the middle, another one down. Control here, one in the middle, another one down. Same pattern. So what happened is that this willow is, is just unbelievable. Um, it started to relief. And so that's the reason why we've got an herbicide that has an intermediate uh, condition, is that the willow is putting out leaves. It's not putting them out on the tips of the branches the way it normally would. It's down along the stems. And even with the clear cast, um, it's regenerating from the horizontal branches that were running down along the ground. So we didn't effectively kill it to the roots, it's starting to come back. So this is where the adjustment comes in. So the plan is to spray a second time with the clear cast and to substitute another herbicide for the AquaSweep. So we're gonna, we just about three or four weeks ago, the district did that spraying and so we'll have those data available pretty soon. So now we come to the assessment part of, okay, what did we learn from all this? Well, Will has an evapotranspiration rate that based on other work in the, the districts done is about 140 millimeters per year higher than any of the other herbaceous plants. So, okay, that's about that much. That much over 100,000 acres of willow is a lot of water that's being taken. Um, the ET rate decreased by about 620 millimeters per year when the willows got defoliated by the herbicides. So if you took that six inches and then added in the extra, this is gonna be uh, 620, 240. Get to stand up, that much water. Okay, so there's a lot of water being lost to the system from, from the willow taking it out. Um, our problem, and this is the same thing we noted in our previous work, is that the willows are really resilient. Um, they relief after the herbiciding, and so we need to find a more effective way to treat them. Um, and so that's what the plan is moving forward. And so we're, we've gone through this loop. You know, we've now come to that 
assessment um, area again, where we're starting to, to redesign and do some other work to try to find a really effective way to, to manage the willow. With that, I'd just like to acknowledge the folks who did the hard work in the swamp um, and the folks at the St. John's River Water Management District who went in there with us. And I'd be happy to, to take questions. system if the precipitation doesn't fall in the system. Uh, the fact that it has, you've got evapotranspiration doesn't mean it's gone, it just means it's being cloud stored for a period of time. Yeah, that's true, uh, although what's happening, the data we have so far is just for the wet season. So when it's dry, then the willows can pull that out of the soil. And so then, yeah, you're right, it goes up, but then it, be, it gets transported. And so a lot's gonna depend on uh, where the two um, sea breezes collide and where that water comes back down again. And that varies even among our two sites. So yeah, you're right, it depends on where it goes. But when it comes down, some of it could run off, some of it can get back into the river, um, some of it can get intercepted by foliage. But during the drought, what we need is a drought. We need Mother Nature to gift us with a drought next year so we can get the opposite conditions and really understand the range of parameters. Um, you, you talk about um, replacement plants, uh, and you never said anything about that. It did, um, was the herbicide specific to the willow, or did it wipe out everything else, and did anything replace the willow? Um, these uh, herbicides were selected deliberately to try to minimize the effects on the non-target species. And so the one species that's clearly benefiting, and we've got vegetation plots that we're looking at, is buttonbush. So the buttonbush is going crazy where now it's, it's gotten uh, sunlight coming down to it and it's, it's coming back up. So that's a plant that, you know, it, it can get this high, it's usually kind of shoulder height, um, and it emerges as, a, as kind of a bush. So it's, it's not as shrubby and woody as a willow is. Um, but in a thicket, you probably wouldn't want to try to run your airboat into that, and, and you know, a, a duck boat's not going through that either. But it may be easier to control secondarily with something else. That's, that's the hope. 